Hello, this is a summary of Susanna Clarke's novel Peronessi and a character analysis of the eponymous protagonist Peronessi. The biggest part of the novel is set in an alternate world where a man called Peronessi lives. He is between 30 and 35 years old and he dwells in an infinitely a man's house that he calls the house and the world. There are countless halls and vestibules in a house, and it is made of three levels. The basement is submerged by water, and a ground floor is where Peronessi lives. It often gets flooded by seawater. Peronessi spends most of his time exploring the halls in his floor, fishing for food, studying the climate, examining the many statues scattered in the house, tending to the skeletal remains of 13 dead people, and writing everything he does in a journal. There is only one one other human being in the house. Peronessi calls him the other. They meet twice a week on Tuesday and Friday. The other is older than Peronessi, he's between 50 and 60, and he tells Peronessi that there is a secret knowledge hidden somewhere in the house. This knowledge would grant whoever possesses it superpowers. The other needs Peronessi's help to find this knowledge. Peronessi isn't really convinced by any of this, but he plays along. The other is austere and quite patronizing. He gives Peronessi things that can't be found in a house, like blankets, shoes, a fishing net. There is something strange about the other. You can easily suspect he gets things from outside the house, but Peronessi doesn't, for a fraction of a second, entertain the thoughts that the other gets out of the house and back to it. For Peronessi, there is nothing but the house. The world is the house. In one of their meetings, Peronessi tells the other that that he doesn't really believe in the story of this secret hidden knowledge. This angers the other. He tells Peronessi that it is not the first time he has voiced skepticism as to the existence of the knowledge. They have already had similar discussions about the knowledge. The other tells Peronessi that he forgets things. Peronessi can't believe he does. He remembers everything about the holes in a house. The other insists that Peronessi does forget many things, even their Tuesday and Friday meetings. Peronessi starts to doubt his memory. And after all, he has always known his name wasn't Peronessi, but couldn't remember his real name. He decides to read some of his old entries in his journal to see if there is anything that he doesn't remember. And he discovers that yes, there are many things he doesn't remember living or writing about. The other warns Peronessi about the advent of a person into the house. This person is referred to as 16, because there are 13 skeletons plus Peronessi in the other. This would make the incoming person the 16. The other tells Peronessi that he'll lose his mind if he ever were to talk to Sixteen. He tells him that Sixteen is an evil person. Then Peronessi meets an old man in the house, who refers to this man as the Prophet. The Prophet reveals to Peronessi many things about the world he lives in. The Prophet informs him that he is imprisoned in this world. It is an alternate world created from ideas flowing out of another world. He reveals to Peronessi the identity of the other. The other's real name is Valentine Ketterly. He is Peronessi's abductor. The prophet tells Peronessi that he should talk to the incoming person 16, whose real name is Raphael. Peronessi doesn't know what to make of this encounter. He keeps reading his old entries from his diary and he learns that at some point in the past, a certain Matthew Rose Sorensen was interested in research in the claims of a notorious occultist called Lawrence Ansales, who is the prophet. He was charged with abducting a young man called Paul Ritter and keeping him imprisoned in a large house filled with water and statues. Bernessi doesn't realize that he is the researcher Matthew Sorensen. Lawrence Ansales claims to find portals to alternate worlds. A certain Van Ketterly agreed to be interviewed by Matthew Sorensen. Van Ketterly was a disciple of Lawrence Ansales, but their views would diverge. Ketterly showed Sorensen the alternate world, that is the house, and locked him up there. Raphael, or 16, arrives in a house. Bernessi learns about her arrival by smelling her perfume in a house. They don't meet in the beginning, they communicate by leaving each other messages written with chalk or rocks. Raphael is a policewoman trying to find the missing person Matthew Rose Sorensen, which is Peronessi's real name. 
She convinces him to get out of the house and back to the real world. Thanks to his studies of the climate in the house, Pernessy is able to predict a violent flood will hit some parts of the ground floor. He meets 16 or Raphael on the day of the flood. Catalay pulls a gun and starts shooting at them. Pernessy and 16 laboriously manage to survive the flood and Catalay's bullets. Catalay is hit by a wave that violently smashes him against the statue and he dies. 16 finally gets to introduce herself to Pernessy. Pernessy eventually gets out of the house, but he can't think of himself as Matthew Sorensen or even as Pernessy. He feels nostalgic to the house and visits it together with Paul Ritter, the other captive, and Raphael, the police officer of freedom. Pernessy character analysis. Pernessy is kidnapped. He is held in captivity in a supernaturally big house with endless halls and vestibules. He faces lethal hazard in the form of violent floods. He is in quasi-solitary confinement. There is only one other person he meets and gets to converse with, and this other person is not really nice. He is patronizing and is available only on Tuesdays and Fridays. Food is hard to come by. Pernessy is losing his memory. Yet, despite all of this, he seems serene, can Tent, we could even say happy. So how does he pull that off? Peronesi views the world or the house in the same way that Spinoza views nature. It is governed by the principle of sufficient reason. Everything that happens is the effect of some cause. Nothing that happens is inherently good or bad, just or unjust. All there is is cause and effect. There are no expectations from some cosmic power that you may call God to serve justice or to hold any telos. Based on this, Pernesi accepts the situation he's in. He accepts the harsh climate conditions. He studies them and tries to understand them, to know how the flood floods happen and to try to anticipate them. He doesn't rue the harshness of life. All there is is the house and the laws that govern the house. And Pernese himself is not above these laws. He is in the house and part of the house. Pernese goes a further step that is in accordance with Spinoza's philosophy. Pernese acts as an ethical egoist. Ethical egoism follows naturally from the abandonment of oneself to the laws of nature or the laws of the house. Because the laws of the house are far beyond the control of Peronesi, he needs not to worry about them or let them affect him negatively. All he can do is seek his own advantage. It is what all organisms do. All organisms seek their advantages and strive to persist in being. What Peronesi does is seek everything that benefits him without letting anything outside his control affect him negatively. To borrow Spinoza's jargon, Peronesi immunizes himself against the effects. The only thing that motivates Peronesi's actions is to serve his advantage. He achieves serenity and inner tranquility in seeking his advantage in congruence with the dictates of reason. We can contrast Peronesi with the other. While Peronesi is always talking about science and understanding how the tides work, the other is trying to perform a ritual to summon the spirit of an ancient king and to find a secret knowledge that can grant superpowers above nature. And while per Peronesi plays along, he doesn't believe in any of all these superstitions. Letting himself be affected by the occasional scarcity of food, the imprisonment and the loneliness simply doesn't benefit him. Being an ethical egoist, he wouldn't do anything that doesn't benefit him. Spinoza's ethical egoism is balanced by a form of contractarianism. In order for all of us to seek uh, egotistical interests, we need a social contract that puts some limits on how we can be ethical egoists and still live in peace. Peronesi doesn't need a social contract because there is no society around him. The only person he meets is the other and they only meet twice a week on Tuesdays and Fridays. This puts Peronesi in a comfortable situation. He gets to be an ethical egoist and frees himself from the limitations of any social contractarianism. It explains why Peronesi feels extremely nostalgic to the house after he gets out to the real world. He comes back to the house after he's freed. He takes with him James Ritter, the other person who was imprisoned there, they both cherish their time in the house. At one point while they're in the house, Ritter begs Peronesi to let him stay some more time. Towards the end of the novel, Peronesi recognizes the superiority of the statues in the house over the people in the real world. 
We find this concept of ethical egoism in Thomas Hobbes's philosophy and in Baruch Spinoza's. Peronesi is a Spinozist ethical egoist, though the difference is that for Spinoza, ethical egoism is warranted by his metaphysical doctrine of the conatus, while Hobbes's ethical egoism ensues from the person's appetite. Appetite is the last push that strikes a person after a process of deliberation. Alternatively, the conatus is the idea that everything in nature seeks its own advantage. It seeks to avoid its annihilation and to persevere in being. The argument for ethical egoism goes like this. Reason never contradicts nature. It is against nature for something not to pursue its advantage and to ward off its destruction. Hence, reason dictates that everything seeks its advantage and wards off its destruction. The first premise delineates what reason is. Reason is limited by two principles. Number one, the principle of contradiction, something that contradicts itself cannot be reasonable. And number two, the agreement with nature, something that is contrary to nature, is not reasonable. Based on this, it is impossible for anything in nature not to seek its advantage and not to ward off its destruction. Now, acting in accordance with reason, which in this situation means being an ethical egoist, is not necessarily prescriptive. We don't all act in accordance with reason. Peronesi does, but not all of us do. Acting in accordance with reason by being an ethical egoist is what grants Peronesi serenity and contentment. Spinoza says that whoever Whoever acts contrary to nature does so because he is under the influence of inadequate ideas. Inadequate ideas comprise passions, affects, superstitions and imagination. Peronesi's ethical egoism allows him to lead a nice life in a reality that might scare many of us. Loneliness, captivity, scarcity of food. However, after he gets out of the house, back to the real world, it remains to be seen or reflected upon whether Peronesi will be able to continue being the ethical egoist has been in the house. The distractions in the real world are countless and the real world requires a stiffer social contract because the real world hosts plurality. It is populated by many people who also seek their advantages. Now this video has reached its end. Until we meet again, have a great day.